Habits and Health, episode 13. Welcome to the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to the podcast where we give you ideas on habits you can create that will improve your health in some shape or form. Today's episode is with Professor Vincent Walsh and it's a fascinating episode. We dig quite deep into sleep and learning and how sleep helps learning and and many other aspects of those two subjects. Please do review, leave a review for us on iTunes, why not subscribe and share this episode with your friends who maybe would get some real value from some of the nuggets that Vincent shares in this episode. Habits and Health, my guest today is Vincent Walsh. How are you, Vincent? I'm good, thank you. Nice to be here, Tony. And it's a, I don't know about where you are, but it's a beautiful day down here. Um, no, it's it's pretty grey outside, outside the windows uh, and it's tipping it down, but... Um, <laughs> And you're in you're in Camden. Yeah, I, I live in central London. Uh, work in UCL, uh, the shortest commute of my life. I've got a twenty minute walk to work. I mean, I haven't been there for a year. Um, like everybody else, I've now got a thirty second walk from my bedroom to my uh, to my desk. Um, but yeah, I, I, I I'm, I'm committed to central London. I, I love it. And what is so? What what do you do at UCL? I uh, have a, a research group there. Uh, I have a, a chair in human brain research. Um, I do some work on, on sleep uh, and uh, sleep and learning, sleep and cognition. Uh, one current PhD student is working on sleep in the blind um, because they have special issues. Um, I have another PhD student working on brain stimulation in, uh, in, in, in migraine and depression. Um, another PhD student just finished on decision making under pressure, working mostly with elite sports people. Um, somebody else looking at, uh, uh decision making and learning in, uh, industrial contexts or work contexts, uh, not heavy industry, desk industry. Um, I'm trying to, trying to think if I've forgotten any of my, my students, I hope not. Um, and there's another one working on, uh, on, on sleep. Uh, at the moment as well so that's my uh, the two the two big things are brain stimulation there's always something going on in that and uh and, and sleep uh, and i'm trying to do m- more in sleep and and decision making and learning um, but you know life's finite <laughs> and what was it that that led you into doing that in the first place uh, i was a, a nurse for, for for eight years uh when i, I left school um, I just got interested in, uh, in, in what I thought was clinical psychology at that time, um, which is what a lot of people who do psychology degrees think they're interested in. Um, and, uh, yeah, went to night school so, uh, so I, could, I could do that. And, um, and then when I was doing my psychology degree, I, I just got hooked on the, uh, the, the biological side of it. At that time, the physiology of, of perception. Um, and then did a, a PhD uh, in the physiology of, of perception, looking at colour vision and how colour is constructed in the brain. A couple of things went right, a couple of things went wrong after that. And, um, uh, yeah, I ended up in, uh, in, in UCL. Mainly, I, I, I focused on brain stimulation for about 15 years um, before I got into to, to other things. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I just became more and more hooked on, um, on, on, on ideas about the brain, scientific ideas in general, and finding ways to, to do the experiments. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got lucky. There was one, one stage where I, 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 I was about to give up. I, two years had gone particularly badly. Yeah, I, I'd say, I, I'd say there's no difference now between the intellectual drive now and, and what there was. 30 years ago when I went to, went to university. Wow. And so in that time, what is the most maybe surprising discovery that you've made? Well, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if I've made any that I would call surprising. Um, rather than a surprising discovery, it, it's the, 
what you do do is you, you encounter surprising ideas all the time. So, you know, right from the very beginning, the idea that, um, that color doesn't exist out in the real world, um, in the physical world, it, it's actually constructed by, by, by your brain. Um, so we, you know, you get taught at school that, that, that Newton discovered that white light is, is divided into different wavelengths and long wavelengths make you perceive red, but, uh, it's just not the case. What the brain does is take a set of ratios and decide what is red. And sometimes it can have, uh, more, more green, what you would call green light coming from it than red light. So, uh, you know, just the very idea that, that something that we see every day and f- sometimes think that we understand, um, isn't the way that we thought it was. And that's what, that's where I always get hooked when, when things are not what you would f- think them to be. When, when, when the science disagrees with our, um, uh, our, our perceptions of, of, of common sense. So that, that's the kind of, of trope that, 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 that I find all the time. Another great experience was, you know, I had one PhD student working on perception of time, one PhD student working on the construction of number in the brain, and, uh, one PhD student working on, on space in the, in the brain. And, uh, these were three very separate literatures, but, um, we were all, all three students were looking at the same brain area. So from that, we started to look at, well, um, our, uh, our space and time and number all from the same kind of, uh, core system of magnitudes in the, uh, in the human brain. Is that how, how we develop? Um, and you know, there's no way you can intuit things like that. So I, I, it's whenever, uh, whenever you come across something that you can't intuit, but you just have to struggle with the truth of it. That's, that, that's what is what I find not surprising, but, but exciting. I think I, I, um, one, there's one kind of knockout fact, which I always I tell people about in, in my sleep lecture, which is that, that every cell in your body has a, has a clock, you know, uh, that, that was, uh, that, that was a great, great wake up call as well. Um, but I, I get constantly surprised and, and re-surprised by, by ideas, um, you know, it, it's, I just finished a, um, uh, reading a, a book, uh, uh, which I've read several times on, on relativity. And, you know, no matter, it, it, people take things for granted. We think we understand things because they're out there. Um, but the challenge to me is always, well, can you explain it to somebody? Do you understand it well enough to explain it? Um, and, you know, just very, uh, very basic ideas there. And the same for the theory of evolution. If you really think about them, your head has to spin. And that's, that's the kind of intellectual high I'm looking for, if you like. <laughs> and what you just said about the, you know, every cell has, a, has its own clock. So for people who are listening and thinking, well, what, what's that all about then? Do you want to explain that? Well, I mean, um, um, our, our bodies run on, 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 a, on a circadian uh, system uh, and, and these timing mechanisms exist in uh, every other animal and, uh, you know, mammals, birds, insects, the genes that respond to this circadian rhythm, this 24 hour clock, it's, it's been there for as long as they've been there for as long as the sun's been rising over the earth, um, or, or rather the earth's been going around the sun. Um, and, uh, the, the genes for time, uh, are, are some of the most highly preserved in biology. They were amongst the first genes discovered, Tim and Pear genes, precisely because, uh, a fruit fly Time set of time genes look a lot like ours, um, and um, and this is in uh, you know this, this, this is expressed in in every cell in your body because every cell in your body will go through that twenty four hour cycle. So mm-hmm. the example I always like to give is that uh, you know if I go to the bathroom at seven o'clock in the morning, you go at nine o'clock in the morning, then you get my kidney in a kidney transplant. You'll start going to the bathroom at seven o'clock in the morning until you retrain my my kidney clocks. Um, and that's where I really came in uh, uh, with um, a, a deeper interest in, in, in sleep and sleep health, um, realizing that you can't game a three and a half billion year old system. <laughs> it's going to be tough. <laughs> and, and that makes me think about, I mean, it, there seems to be so many aspects of sleep that are misunderstood by society today that would that, that affect our health in so many ways. I mean, I, I, I think in one sense it's it's really simple. Um, um, it's a bit like it's a bit like 
diet and exercise and uh, and health. You know, just eat stuff that looks like food. Um, don't eat more of it than you use, and uh, and exercise. Uh, so, so it's kind of not a not a mystery, but we make it complicated for ourselves. Um, with with sleep, um, I think because it's the thing that we do the most in our lives. We do it more than anything else. Whatever you do in your life, you'll sleep more than it. And because everybody does it, um, and there are 7 billion of us, there's, there's going to be a lot of spread, a lot of differences in, in people's experiences. So it's one of those things where even if science makes a population statement about sleep, the, the most famous being eight hours that people worry about, mm. you know, there's going to be a few billion people who that doesn't fit because uh, of statistical spread. So it's one of the hard, although it's fundamental to all of us and the fundamentals are the same, it's hard to make um, population statements that, that won't leave some of your audience behind every time you speak to a, a group of people. But the, the fundamentals are that um, uh, we, we all have to do it and that it's probably the, more important than anything else that we do do in terms of health and, and well-being. If you're not sleeping properly, you're not doing anything else properly. I have this little mantra, if you're not sleeping properly, you're not dieting properly. If you're not sleeping properly, why aren't you dieting properly? You're not dieting properly because during sleep, your dietary hormones are, are, are re-regulated. So it helps you to um, um, know when you're hungry and when, you, when you're full. We all eat too much when we sleep badly. Um, if you're not sleeping properly, you're not exercising properly because of muscle recovery. If you're not sleeping properly, you're not learning properly because of memory consolidation of sleep. If you're not sleeping properly, you're not being as good with other people as you can. You're not a good social being because sleep helps you to um, uh, regulate your social monitoring and, and, and emotional systems. So the first fundamental is that it's probably the most important thing that, that, that you do, mm. but we kind of just hope it goes right. Uh, our passivity about it is is, is quite quite astonishing. Um, and the rules about it, I think, are pretty simple as as, as well. That going back to the circadian system and the and the sun, you ne- need to get your lighting regime right. So, you know, I think I, I might have said at the lecture that you came to, if you've got. If you've got a, a television in your bedroom, just just leave the room. I've no in, you don't deserve to sleep. I've no interest in talking to you. Um, uh, you know, bombing out, bombarding us, uh, ourselves with with artificial light is is sending this massive signal to our central master clock in the brain that it's daytime, um, and that clock is three and a half billion years old. So it's uh, well, not not the clock in humans because we aren't three now, but but the biological responses to that are very very old. Um, so that's the first. The second golden rule is heat. Our, our houses are much hotter than ever before, five degrees hotter than they were even 40 years ago. Um, and when we go to sleep at night, before we go to sleep, our bodies start to cool down the core temperature. Um, and habits. Um, clocks like to be run regularly. Um, and, you know, many of us don't have good sleep habits. You know, when should I go to bed? Well, you know, when I've finished this episode. <laughs> Why should I go to bed now? Well, maybe I'll just do one more episode. Heat, light, and habits, I think, are three of the uh, the four golden rules of sleep. And the fourth is is anxiety, which is because you do it more, more often than anything else you do in your life, it's unreasonable to expect it to be perfect all the time. So um, uh, it's a good idea to be less anxious about the occasional bad night's sleep that, that you might, might have. Um, you know, if you're getting... Say four good nights sleep a week. You're doing you're doing very well. Um, it's a bit like making a New Year's resolution to go to the gym every day, uh, learn a foreign language, and and not drink. You know, maybe if you're only drinking once a week, that's good enough. Maybe if you go to the gym two or three times a week, that's good enough. Um, I, I can't help you with the foreign language, but um, uh, you know. So maybe if you if you just get your habits right, so that you get three, four, or five good nights of sleep, that would be an improvement for for most people. Um, the hard part, it's not, it's not in understanding it. Everybody knows this in the same way as we know what to do for, for our kind of food and weight, health and well-being. Uh, the hard part is not understanding. It's operationalizing, doing it every day. You know, it demands our efforts. It demands us to make an effort to, to engage and take responsibility. Um, 
and we all fail at that. <laughs> Well, I mean, you mentioned when I saw you talk, you, one of the things you mentioned was the anxiety or the worry that people put on themselves by thinking or they've been told that they should have interrupted sleep every night. Yeah. And do you mean uninterrupted sleep? Un- uninterrupted sleep, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, people do worry when they, they wake up in the middle of the night, uh, but it, it's thoroughly natural. Um, mm. The unnatural thing, not unnatural, but the rarer thing is to expect to be able to sleep through eight hours. Well, the reason mm. we do, some people do that, some people can, but uh, a lot of people also had to train for it <laughs> and just get very tired over their working lives so that they sleep at night. Um, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, um, it, it, there was no such thing as a night's sleep. You know, there would be, people would sleep two or three times a day, an afternoon nap, uh, an early sleep early part of the night and a late sleep in the late part of the night and pre-industrial societies still do that um it's called polyphasic sleeping when it when it in its sunday dress um but uh there isn't a single pre-industrial society where they sleep just during the night um uh, everybody everybody naps and so it's quite natural to, uh, to to nap i nap every day almost every day you know you, you um uh, sometimes real life in, intervenes um, during lockdown. I've certainly napped almost every day. It's been a, a sleeping boon for me. Uh, most people, you know, it's it's not. I won't say most people, but I would say it's 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 completely normal to wake up in the middle of the night. And uh, perhaps just understanding that will help people not to worry about it. Mm-hmm. So uh, the 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 helpful response to it is to think right. It's normal to wake up in, in, in the middle of the night. I might be one of those polyphasic sleepers. So maybe I need a little bit of a routine to help me get back to sleep in the uh, middle of the night. Uh, and I have one uh, for the nights I wake up. Um, and some nights I do wake up, some nights I don't wake up. Uh, the key is I just accept uh, to what, what does happen. On the nights I do wake up, I, I get up, I make myself a cup of hot water because that's what I drink. And um, I go into my living room and put on my very dim, um, um, low color temperature, reddish light, and, and read by that. And um, two things. One is it's a little bit too dim to read, so my eyes get tired. Uh, three things, rather. Secondly, I'm not anxious, so I'm not worried that, oh, I'm going to be awake till the morning. Um, and the third thing is, is because I always do that when I wake up, I've got this habit. So my body's clocks are saying, I've been here before. This is when we stay up for a bit read a bit of a chapter that we're going to forget and then get tired because he's not got the lights on brightly enough. And then I go back to bed and, and, and sleep. Um, and, you know, for, uh, it's, we've all got difficulties with, with sleeping. Mine is that I'm, a, I'm very much a night owl. I'm very happy to, to be up at, at, at 1, 1.30. Uh, 2 o'clock would, would be a, um, a modal bedtime for me, um, which means I'm very unhappy if I have to get up before 10 o'clock. Um, um, so, and I know in real life we can't all construct our lives around our, our our body clocks, but it's really worth bearing in mind, I think. And and that brings on, I mean, about night owls and uh, morning larks, because it's, it's quite different, isn't it? And there's a lot of, a lot of people are one or, or the other. Yeah, the, well, no, no uh, people aren't one or, or the other. So, you know, we, we have a a tendency to dichotomize things because it helps mm. us to, to understand them. Uh, so... Um, you know, it, it does help to think, oh, there are night owls and, and there are morning morning larks. The truth is that the vast majority of people are somewhere smudgy in between. Right. So uh, the vast majority of people, you can kind of um, um, respond healthily to a life shift, which means that you get up two hours earlier, but regularly. Mm-hmm. Or you can respond to a life shift, which means that you don't finish work till nine o'clock at, 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 at night. Um so for the vast majority of us, we're kind of um, a, a bit morningy and a bit, bit, a bit eveningy. There are some people, uh, a small percentage of people who are at the extremes, who are very much uh, uh, night owls or, uh, or, 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 or morning larks. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I would discourage people from too hastily categorizing themselves as, as, as one or the other. It can be shifted a little bit. Um, the people who we should worry about other people who are um, uh, working night shifts because although there's a spread across 
um, chronotype, it's called, whether you're a morning or a night person. There's a population spread across that. Um, uh, we're still diurnal animals. We're not nocturnal. So um, shift work presents you know, really uh, big health challenges for, for, for people. Hmm. Um, what you, you, before you talked about temperature as well as being one of those sort of golden three or golden four, what, there, there seems to be a lot of sort of technology that's that's around now that helps to cool the temperature in you know when people are sleeping, such as something called a chili pad, which um, reduces the. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but it reduces the temperature. It's, it's, we don't need a, we just don't need a technological solution for this. I mean, um, turn your radiator off, uh, open your window in the summer, um, have different weights of you know a, a winter and a summer summer quilt. Uh, if you're sleeping in a double bed, it's best to have two single quilts in in the bed so that you you're not uh, getting heated by the the other person's uh, uh, body, and you might just both have different temperature needs. Um, and it's a good idea to um, wear some natural fibre pyjamas because you, you, you sweat a lot during the night. That will take care of it. In addition, if you go to bed regular, you know, similar time-ish every night, those body clocks will be helped to uh, moderate your, um, uh, your, your, your body temperature. Um, but really, it's not that, it's not that hard. Um, and I, I, you know, sleep is one of those things that every animal does. Again, we do it more than anything else in our, in our lives. It's, it's worth it's worth repeating that. Um, it's not a it's not a big stretch to think maybe we've got everything in the natural tank without a technological solution here. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, dark rooms. I don't have a a reading lamp in my bedroom for example i have a central light and then it's it's dark when when that's switched off so dark cool cool rooms we we don't need technology for that maybe in in a heat wave you might want um uh um an air conditioner or a cooler in 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 the room but that's that's as far as it goes yeah and before you touched upon um naps as well how what what do you think people should know about naps because there's a lot of confusion maybe around that well uh, yeah uh, so should uh, should it should is always is my, my least favorite word I, I never know what people should do or should know or should read or should think um uh, i'm happy for them to, to do whatever they like um but i can tell you what i think is important about 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 naps um uh, first important thing i think is that that they they are completely natural uh, there's no need to worry if you if you are a nap or, or indeed be embarrassed if if you if you need a nap. It's um, it's a good idea to think. All right, um, I I eat when I'm I'm hungry usually or snack when I'm I'm hungry. Um, I exercise when I feel that I'm you know physically able to exercise. Why shouldn't I sleep when my body tells me I I, I should sleep? So the first is it's, it's natural. Um, the, the the second is is to think well what what is a nap. Uh, and, and, bra- and sleep itself is defined as a brain state. So what kind of br- a brain state is a nap? During sleep, we go through 90-minute cycles of, 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 of light sleep, stage two sleep, uh, uh, stages three and four, which people call deep sleep, and REM sleep. And uh, we go through that 90-minute cycle several times a night. And you go through those stages as well in a nap. Now, uh, you're usually in the lighter sleep in stage two for up to 30, m- maximum 40 minutes for part of that, that cycle. So if you go beyond that, then you get into deep sleep. And that's why when people say, oh, I've tried napping and it didn't work for me. So usually they woke up after 50 minutes an hour and felt groggy. And that's because you're in deep sleep um, and it's the worst time to, to wake up. Um, so that's where the power nap comes from. 20, 30 minute nap, I think is a, is a good idea. So that's where the power nap comes from. Uh, 20, 30 minutes. If you go beyond that, that's why you get groggy. Um, and the n- next thing to, to know about, uh, that 90 minute sleep cycle is that if you, if you go beyond the 20, 30 minutes, it's a good idea to go through the whole 90 minutes and then you wake up in, in light sleep and that's when you feel refreshed. Um, and the third thing to know about the uh, structure of naps um, um, is that if you 
if you nap too late in the day, when something called sleep pressure is building up, then your nap will possibly eat in to your uh, sleep diet for the evening. So if people sleep too, nap too late or too long, uh, then they feel that either they, they're groggy or they can't get to sleep as easily in, in the evening. So just as a rule of thumb, but again, everybody is different. I, 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 I try not to nap while I don't nap after three in the, um, in, in the afternoon. That's a bit too, too late for me. And so based on what you were just saying about the whole kind of 90 minute cycle, so therefore if someone, they, they sleep at night and then they have an alarm to wake them up in the morning, and if that alarm goes off halfway through one of those 90 minute cycles, is that going to have an effect on how they're going to feel in the day? Uh, yes. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why people feel groggy in the, in the mornings that the, um, uh, the alarm wakes you up in the wrong part of the cycle. Um, it's, uh, but um, uh, if, if it is waking up in the wrong part of the cycle, it's probably because you haven't had enough, you haven't gone to sleep early enough uh, because uh, in the later part of the night, going towards morning, that's when during that phase, uh, REM sleep and light sleep dominates uh, and there's very little deep sleep. So you've got to be a little bit unlucky to get woken up in deep sleep early in, in the morning. Um, if you're a night owl like me, then it's quite feasible that you might, you know, a seven o'clock alarm will uh, is torture. You know, that's uh, um, uh, and that's because I'm, I'm still not all the way into the you know the very last part of my my night's sleep. Um, so uh, yes, again, real world meets ideal situations. It would be nice if we could wake up naturally every morning, uh, but our working habits. Um, uh, and, and family habits don't always allow that. Uh, so uh, uh, we have to ask, how, how can we win uh, in that, set, uh, in, in that uh, part of the sleep game? Uh, and I, I think it's only by having good habits so that you get used to waking up at the same, same time every, uh, yeah. uh, every day. Yeah. But alarms are generally, you know, they're generally bad things. <laughs> but necessary. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you're looking for the fastest and most effective way to transform your energy and well-being, we invite you to join Tony for an upcoming Habits and Health workshop. This five-week group workshop will empower you with tools to disrupt unwanted habits and make positive changes easy. You'll enjoy sound asleep, better energy, less stress and a happier mood. Workshops begin on the first week of every month and you can sign up now at tonywinyard.com. Now, back to the show. You talked before about, um, about learning and, and, and sleep, but is there, what connections are there between learning and sleep? Um, well, if you think it, who learns the most, the most quickly... It's infants and children, and if you think about what they spend most of their time doing, um, it's sleeping. So uh, there's a big clue there. Um, but uh, we we know now there's a lot of really good evidence. I mean, some super inventive experiments showing that different stages of sleep are absolutely necessary to uh, different state, different types of learning. And whenever I'm giving a um, a, a lecture or a, a, a public talk. I, I, I always say the only person who's learning now is me, because I'm practicing what I'm, I'm doing. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reconsolidating my memories about what I, I know. So mm-hmm. you might say the same now. I'm, I'm learning because I'm really having to think. You're not learning at the moment, um, but I'm putting you in perhaps in a position to learn. Uh, mm-hmm. So when will you learn? You'll learn when um, you go to sleep and your brain replays through the information of the day, makes new connections between what you do know and what you uh, have, 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 have just been engaged in, in learning. And we really need all the phases of sleep, deep sleep, stage two sleep and REM sleep in order to consolidate um, uh, different types of, types of learning. So it's not, it's not that there's a link between sleep and learning, 
I would say that that sleep is uh, the most important um, the most important part or um, uh, yeah of of of, of learning. Um, it, Somebody might trivially say, "Well, what about do, doing the, getting the information in itself?" That's true, um, but you you will never learn uh, uh, properly and deeply if you don't uh, sleep properly. Uh, so, just to put some flesh on those stages, if you're learning things for, let's say, a medical exam, and you've got uh, some anatomical rules to learn, or you're learning a new language and you've got new verb structures to to, to learn and vocabulary to learn, then you really need. Um, uh, deep sleep, stage four sleep. That's, uh, um, I, I think that there would be very few sleep researchers who would um, want to walk back the claim that deep sleep is important for what's called declarative learning, knowing that things are X and things are Y. Um, if you're learning a, a skill, uh, and that skill could be a, a musical instrument, it could be... Um, uh, it could be a, a, a sports skill. Um, uh, it could be learning to, you know, a, 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 to, as a child learning to, to write. Um, anything motoric that involves you know, a, a, a learning skill, we need stage two sleep for that, um, and that's uh, again, I think, uh, pretty pretty well established. And uh, for things that require, um, what can I call them, more. Um, uh, remote links between uh, between things. You might call it creative learning or association learning um, um, or complex association learning. We need REM sleep uh, for that. And also we consolidate emotional memories in, in REM sleep as, uh, as well. Um, uh, the reason that I, I took you through all three major stages of sleep there is uh, that it answers the question, you know, can I? Uh, uh, is there a trade-off between sleep quantity and quality? It's, mm. it's actually not a sensible question uh, because you need all the stages of sleep. Mm. Um, so uh, quality is quantity uh, in, in 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 that sense. You need all aspects of sleep. Um, yeah. Is is there any evidence to? You know, some people like to listen to maybe like a language as as they're dropping off to sleep because. Yeah. Is there any evidence to, to that? No. Right. <laughs> uh, I, there's, there's good evidence against it. Uh, having, having said that, um, uh, and, and I kind of, you know, just in my own personal philosophy, not got much sympathy with people who want that to work. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, part of the fun of learning things is making an effort. Uh, um, uh, there is evidence, however, that... Um, you can help the consolidation of what you learn during the day um, by prompting it from the outside during sleep. So just to give, um, they call it targeted reactivation. Uh, uh, what I think was quite a lovely example uh, is uh, one group gave um, uh, uh, subjects in an experiment the uh, things to learn on a computer screen, the location of of, of, of vehicles and, and, and objects on a computer screen. And while they were uh, doing that, they were exposed to a certain kind of smell. Um, can't remember what the smell was, to be honest. And then in the experiment, what they did was they uh, had people sleep, and during slow wave sleep, which they knew was important for this kind of memory, during slow wave sleep, they exposed uh, the people to the smell again. And in another group they expose people to the smell but during REM sleep so not slow wave sleep and another group they didn't expose them to the smell during the learning but gave them the smell during the slow wave sleep uh, so really you know all the uh, all the the, the, the the proper controls and it, it was really um, uh, quite convincing that um, and as a control task by the way they give people a, a skill task to learn uh, and and uh, expose people to the order for that as well. Um, and it was only the group that had been exposed to the smell during learning and during slow wave sleep uh, who had accelerated or improved performance on that learning. So does that, am I contradicting myself there? N not really, um, because you, you know, uh, 
you have to do the learning anyway in the first place. What that experiment shows is that uh, that during slow wave sleep, the brain is still taking in some information from the the outside world. So if you uh, if when the smell comes in, the brain is reacting to that smell, and that will reactivate more strongly some of the memories of the things that you were learning learning that day. So it strengthens the the association. But I, I have to say, it's probably still a better idea to just organise your learning and follow good principles of of, of learning and, and recall and get normal sleep. Um, I, I, you know, it's one of the things I get asked a lot because I work on sleep and learning and, and, and creativity, which is, uh, is people want shortcuts. And and the best shortcut is uh, seems always to be to do it properly in the first place. <laughs> um, what would, I mean, on that topic of you know, creativity and learning, so what is a good way then of someone who's, studying for a particular course and they've got various books that they have required reading for that course and they're reading them and they just not take any information yeah. in what is a have you got any suggestions for i them? mean i i i, I do I, I in fact I, I i give a lecture on this to my second year students uh, and it's interesting because um they're they're on uh one of the hardest courses to get on in in uh, ucl which is one of the hardest universities to get into, um, and uh, they've taken um, an option with me, which you know I'm. I don't think any of my students would say I'm cuddly. Uh, it, uh, um, it, I, I, I drive them, but it's interesting to, and they're super smart. But it's interesting to me that they, they they've never uh, uh, had a, any instruction on how to learn, and you know yet they're at the the top of the education system. Um, and I sometimes think, is it, is it just because it's not because they're good at learning? It's because everybody else is so bad at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if there's one thing we know in in, in psychology and neuroscience, it's how people learn. We can really deliver the hard part, like sleep and like diet and exercise. Is it, it, it demands that we take responsibility and uh, and, uh, and engage. Um, so it, yes, we we know what the rules are. Um, and particularly during COVID, I, I, I've, I've tried to take this as a, as a positive of doing online um, lectures and tutorials, uh, seminars with students, which is to say, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity because the external world is no longer giving you structure. It's a great opportunity for you to learn how to structure your, 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 your learning and it will pay dividends in, in everything. Um, and the, the first thing is that... You know, let's take that example you gave, you know, a student for, for example. What, we've all done it. Uh, what you do is you surround yourselves with books on the table and, and hope that, that karma will somehow reward you for, for sitting amongst them. And you say, I've done three hours revision. and You haven't. You've just sat amongst your books for three hours. Um, so what's a better way of doing it? Um, the first is to, to, to set a limit on what you do. You know? If you, you go to a lesson... Uh, you go to the gym, you go um, uh, to your to music practice, whatever you usually do, you, you set a time limit for it. So uh, why not do that with, with learning uh, periods and set a realistic one? Um, if you think, um, how long can you sit down and really concentrate for? I think, I think 20 minutes is, is a pretty good ask, you know? Uh, so why not divide your... Um, uh, learning sessions up into 20 minutes uh, and uh, uh, a second good idea is to, to have a goal so people sit down they read the, the textbooks and they somehow hope that the again resting on karma that, that the, the, the structure of the information will land upon them <laughs> um, but if you sit down for a 20 minute session it's a good idea to say what do I want to know from this 20 minutes and it can be one thing it's just one clean concept um, and then you know why you're reading it's, it's astonishing to me uh, how many students don't know why they're reading what they're reading they kind of doing volume and hoping at some stakes and then the third thing would be to spend the last few minutes of that 20 minutes uh, asking yourself you know just no one than, than three bullet points what did I learn from this 20 minutes um, uh, so that's the first thing have short sessions with a goal at the start of the next session, test yourself. 
did, did I really learn them? Uh, one of the things I like to do um, is test myself by um, by explaining things to, to people. So uh, whenever I do give a lecture or, or a talk, I uh, you can bet your boots that there's something in there that I'm not really sure about, and I'm testing whether I've got the right understanding of it. Uh, and I think every lecture and has had the experience where you, you see a slide come up on the screen and you think, what was I thinking? Um, and I, I like to set that for myself because you, you don't really understand something until you can explain it to people in, in plain English. I, I think that's a, a fair test of whether you understand something. Um, and uh, that'd be the, so, so, so far, good rules for learning ha have a fixed period, 20 minutes. Know what you want to get out of it. Test yourself at the end of the period and at the start of the next one whether you got something uh, out of it so that it's an active process. The second uh, golden rule uh, from psychology, and this isn't, you know, uh, this isn't the fantastic new rule that, 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 that some you know, enthusiastic, inspirational guru has worked out. This is 100 years of, of psychology, um, is to space your learning out and to interleave it. So mm. do little and often and mix it up in, in plain English. So 20 minutes of, uh, of, of subject A, 20 minutes of, of subject B, 20 minutes of subject C. And if you really have got into that one hour with an entry goal, an exit test, an entry test from, from the previous 20 minutes, um, you'll be less fatigued, less frustrated, uh, and you'll be learning more. Um, and uh, I, I think there are, there, are, there are, you know, there are lots of other good rules from, from psychology, but unfortunately they, they sometimes conflict with the way we construct education uh, um, and, and the way we like to feel as if we're learning. So one ugly rule of learning is, is that it, it shouldn't feel good. Um, mm. So people get frustrated when um, uh, they don't feel as if they're, they're learning, but um, uh, but if I just go back one, one, one to the part of the last answer uh, to drive home the interleaved point, um, you know, you wouldn't, if you were training for a marathon, you wouldn't go and run 15 miles in the morning and then go and do heavy leg squats in the gym in the afternoon mm. because you know that your legs need recovery time to mm. consolidate, if you like, build muscle and restore the energy from that 15-minute run in the morning. And yet we do it all the time in our intellectual um, uh, 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 pursuits. We think that more is more. Uh, but recovery time, consolidation, giving the brain time to play with the information is really important. Um, the, the, so this is now a really paradoxical uh, thing, but it, it's, it, it, it's really super well supported by decades and decades of, of well-replicated experiments. And it's that it's it's best not to give people or everything they need to know to learn something. Uh, so I'll give you uh, just one example uh, that if you um, if you give people, uh, say you're teaching them uh, how to calculate volumes in in, in in maths, if you give one lesson where you you absolutely nail it and you uh, ev nobody leaves the room until, until everybody can calculate the volume. Uh, everybody is happy, because they, including the teacher. Uh, and there's a little bit of courage needed from us, actually, as teachers to, uh, uh, to make this work. Um, students feel good because they've, they've, they've got a gold star for learning how to do, to do volumes. But then you've got another group of people, and that, that next group comes in, and they, the group comes in the next day, and they do another set of volumes. So they've done cubes, and now they do spheres, and next lesson they do columns. But if you compare them with a group of people who've jumbled them up in um, uh, in their lessons so that they leave lesson one, actually, they can't do any of them. And they come out for lesson two and they really still can't do any of them. They're just creeping towards it. But you test them six months later. And what you find is that the people who did them one at a time and left with a gold star, A, feel more confident, uh, and B, were happier with their experience than the people who had the jumbled up learning. If you test them six months later, the people with the jumbled up learning are far better than the people, uh, and they were unhappy. <laughs> they were far better than the people who uh, were more confident and were happier and learned more quickly. Um, why is that? It's because if you 
let's imagine that on day one you learn 75% of something, then your brain has got to do something with that 75%. It's got to, where do I put this information? Mm. Uh, so you go back the next day and you learn 75% of the 75%. You've left the brain with work to do. Mm. Yeah. But if you've, so it makes connections with all the other concepts and structures you know about quantities and, and math. So you get a much more deeply interconnected form of learning. Whereas if you've, uh, if you leave the classroom thinking, I can do, I can do cubes, you know, you've kind of, what your brain has done is to write that solved and I'll just put it in the cube box. But it hasn't got any stretchability, any capacity to survive under, uh, uh, under stress. Um, the people who do this best of all are, are music teachers um, um, because anyone who's learned a musical instrument, they, they will know that the music teacher doesn't let you play a whole piece of music incorrectly. They irritatingly stop you after two bars and so on. Okay, let's do these two bars. Um, and uh, w- what they do is, you know, and then, then they'll move you on to another piece of music before you've really learned that one. So they are spacing and interleaving. Um, it's one of the reasons, you know, a lot of times people find music lessons frustrating, but I do think it's one of the rare areas in modern education where people are exposed to learning how to learn. Um, mm-hmm. And um, uh, it, it is, you know, I think that's the most valuable thing we can teach people in schools and universities, uh, learning how to learn. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the reason you uh, go to the weekend university and the reason that I, I get to talk, do public talks at all uh, is because we all want to learn more and more throughout, throughout our lives. Um, but we've been given very bad strategies. Even people with degrees and PhDs have been given very bad strategies for learning. Um, so I, I think learning how to learn is, is, is really important. So we, we, we organize things into manageable chunks. We do little non-consequential testing um, of ourselves. We have a goal um, and we, we mix it up. Uh, we do little, little and often, um, and it might not feel as if you're you're learning. But um, um, as I tell my students, your, your feelings really aren't important. <laughs> Whether you're learning or not, that matters to me. <laughs> so, if I've understood you correctly, then that that would suggest that our education system is just not set up in the right way at all. Because not only are kids sort of sitting all day just be trying to take things in and then they're given homework in the evening as well yeah yeah no it's bonkers uh and uh it, it's uh it, it's it's sad because we you know we're always saying that, that our children are the most important thing in society and 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 there are investment for for the future blah blah but to link the two things we've been talking about sleep and learning um we make them go to school at, at ridiculous hours why? A historical accident. That's when factories started and historically following on from that, that's when shops started and that's when offices started. So, so we, 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 we shoo on our children to that. But in adolescence, the, uh, the, the circadian master clock shifts. So these kids really do need, as again, as a population, there's always a morning kid, um, as a population, they do do better if they can start later in the day. So starting mm. school at 10 or 11 o'clock would be a real sign that we're seriously committed to our children's education. Um, starting school at 8.39 is a really serious sign that we're committed to our own routine and, 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 and that we're happy to make children squeeze into that, whatever the cost. Many studies, Australia, the Netherlands, UK, um, uh, US, uh, tens of thousands of students, if school for teenagers starts at 10 or 11 in the morning, um, they're happier um, which, you know, I guess matters. <laughs> uh, um, they, there's fewer absences, there are fewer disciplinary problems, and their exam results are, are, are better. Uh, and I, I think we overemphasize exam results, but there is, there's no box we don't tick as better if children's school starts, uh, starts later. So that's the first thing that's, that, 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 that links the, the sleep and learning. But to answer your direct question about the, the way we set up education, it's, it's very endpoint focused. Mm. You know, so what you learn at school is um, you can do very little for eight months of the year and then you, 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 take, uh, you drink lots of coffee and stay up very late for a month of the year and you pass exams and I've then done that subject. But um, you know, 
how many people actually remember anything about the subjects that they've got an A star in. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's because the learning hasn't been deep. It's been shallow mm. to meet that, that end point. Um, and there's a real catch-22 here for, for, for parents. You know, I, obviously, you want your child to get the best exam results because that's the, 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 the key to the, to the next step. Um, but you also want your child to be best prepared for 21st century life, which means relearning new skills more often than any other uh, generation. And yet, the way that we're getting them to learn to advance in the education system is, is not about deep learning. It's about end point um, learning. And the, the sadness there for me is that then learning becomes something you do in order to get X and what I think a lot of people learn to appreciate later on is that learning in itself is the fun part. That's the, that's the great activity, um, to, to be uh, engaged in something, knowing that you're getting a little bit better uh, at, at it. Um, because as any expert knows, you, you never do a subject. You've never done it. You know, there's always something else to, to learn. So... Um, not only are we not giving people the skills in order to learn well and retrain and retool to the most rapidly shifting world ever, um, we're denying people um, access to what I think is is one of the real joys in uh, in life, which is being able to to, to learn new things and engage in, in learning new things. Um, I. I, I don't know what we do about that, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I think the timing of schools is a simple one. If we're committed, we, we move. Um, if you're not committed, you just want to pay lip service to, to, to children at school, you don't move. Um, but um, we've seen during the, the pandemic that not only can we move, we can stop it all. <laughs> uh, so after the pandemic, given that we've uh, uh, we've we've kind of had a zero hour on, on, on routines. There is absolutely no excuse now for saying, oh, really, we, we just can't fit school times to 10 or 11. It, it would disrupt everything. Um, we now know that we, we don't die if we disrupt everything. Um, it wouldn't disrupt everything. It would disrupt your mornings. Um, so, yeah, that's... Well, and with all of the success from those tests that were done, all those um, the research that was done in all those various countries you've mentioned... Why then have people not taken action and followed up on that and then changed school times? Some have, um, but um, it's a it, it's a big cultural shift. So in London, we you know there's eight million of us, and at seven thirty in the morning, somebody presses a button and we all play this game called Run Around. <laughs> um, and um, you know, there's it's it's interesting. We've we've managed it at the other end of, of the scale in in. Certainly in, in academia and I, I think in lots of businesses. So we've done things like, you know, we used to have our seminars at, at, at five o'clock in the, the afternoon. Um, that's a really bad idea for anybody who's got to pick children up from school. So we've shifted our seminar times to, uh, to um, allow people to uh, uh, pick their children up for, uh, from school. So we've, 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 we've managed to do it at one end of the day when it makes the lives of the adults better. Mm. Uh, but we uh, we're much slower to do it at the other end of the scale, where it makes the lives of the um, uh, of, of the children better. And you know, it, what does it mean? Uh, does it it means there'll be no nine o'clock meetings? Every night owl in the world is going to say hallelujah. Um, um, uh, some schools have done it. Um, I, I, I think some uh, some local authorities have even have even grasped the uh, grasped the nettle. But um, it's it's. It's a um, all it requires is uh, is for people to walk the walk about how important they think children are uh, and and education is, um, and if it's that important, then I, I, th- I think we could make make moves towards it. There's, time's creeping up on us, and there's about a thousand more questions I would love to ask you, and what we've spoken yeah. about so far. But so just to, before we finish, Vincent, is there? What was the last book you can think of that really moved you in, in whatever way? Oh, gosh. Um, um, I mean, it, 
it's whatever I'm reading at, at the moment. I mean, it's all I do with my time, really. <laughs> um, um, I, and I get moved in different ways. So I'm just looking over at my sofa now and seeing what's on the side of it. There's a book on the history of logarithms. Um, and it doesn't sound very, you know, it, it's not the kind of book that, that has a sex scene. But um, uh, it, I always do like to get into the heads of, of where things came, the, the people who invented things, see where things came from. We do take things for, for granted, you know, um, um, electricity, but then get into the head of Faraday and, and Maxwell and think what they had to, to, to deal with. Um, um, we, um, we take the atomic structure of the world for, uh, uh, for granted. Lots of people think that they understand the theory of, of evolution, but to, to get inside the heads of the scientists and see and try and see it from, from, from behind their eyes, it's, uh, it's really, really humbling. Um, uh, so, you know, you asked me what was the most surprising discovery I've made, but, you know, reading about people like Napier and, 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 and Darwin and, and Humboldt, <laughs> you've got to be very careful about what you dare to call a discovery. Um, so that kind of, move, you know, you could say it's intellectually uh, uh, moving, but, I mean, it's, it, it's all inspiring in the same way as, a, and I mean this as a kind of a sporting achievement is, but next to it, I'm just looking over again, there's a book about, book about Alma Rose, who was Marla's niece, um, who grew up uh, as a, uh, a very um, um, exciting and wonderful life as a Viennese, uh, a musician in Vienna at, uh, at the early 20th century, but died in Auschwitz. Um, uh, and it's a, uh, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of, of things within that uh, that, that story. Um, but then, uh, just to, uh, I'm, I'm looking over at the, uh, then uh, there's another book called, I can see from here called The Rest is Noise by Alec Ross, uh, Alex Ross, a uh, book about 20th century, uh, 20th century music. Uh, and again, people, you, know, you might think I like this kind of music or that kind of music, but to find out where it, it, it came from and the struggles, the battles people had, you know, riots at, at Stravinsky concerts, for example, you know, um, um, and uh, much more, even more recently, a book on the cello suites, the parallel lives of Bach, Casals and, and the suites and, and themselves. So I'd say I'm, I'm never not moved by, by what I read because I, um, um, I, I'm, I'm actively engaged with it. Uh, I'm one of those people who reads with a pencil in his hand. Uh, <laughs> Vincent, this has been absolutely fascinating. So I well, really you say that. I mean, I, I, I told you before, I don't don't listen to podcasts, and I, I, it's part of the culture I've not got into. So, I, um, good luck with your editing. <laughs> you can make that interesting. You can have it. <laughs> Next week is episode 14 with Dr. Paul Worrell, who is a specialist in operating without pain. He helps people to have, well, he gives non-surgical techniques to help people lead a life without pain. It's all about resolving issues of pain that people are having. So that's next week's episode with Dr. Paul, Paul Worrell. If you did enjoy this episode, why not share it with someone who you feel will get some real value from some of the wisdom that Vincent shared with us and see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast.